we'd like to take you today on a little trip down south to Chile because it was there in 1971 amidst the turmoil and excitement of Salvador Allende's early days in office as the America's first legitimately elected socialist head of government that several science fictional Cold War technical developments found their most poignant and bizarre expression. When Allende came to power by the narrowest of electoral margins, he quickly nationalized scores of companies, especially the local branches of multinational corporations. But Chilean workers were even swifter. As foreign technical managers began to leave the country for fear their assets would be expropriated, Chilean workers' councils simply took over their factories. These councils represented shop floor democracy, which fit Allende's political program perfectly, but they often had no idea how to actually run the factories, let alone manage the ebbs and flows of supply and demand. President Allende, although a lifelong Marxist, was well aware by 1970 of the failures of Soviet-style economic planning, where arbitrary diktats and grandiose five-year plans were running the economy right into the ground. What was needed, the Chilean government experts felt, was a comprehensive system of sophisticated, modern, and decentralized socialist economic management. So in July of 1971, Allende's planning chief, this man, Fernando Flores, sought to hire one of the capitalist world's foremost management experts, a cybernetics guru who had previously helped run the British steel industry. His name was Stafford Beer. This was an auspicious choice. Beer was profoundly sympathetic both to Allende's social ambitions and to the management problem that the Chileans were facing. And it couldn't hurt that he looks a bit like Castro as well. Beer's brand new monograph, Brain of the Firm, sought to cope with precisely the sort of large-scale administrative problems the Chileans were facing. Cybernetics, which was invented by Norbert Wiener at MIT during World War II, is the study of communication, feedback, and control mechanisms in complex systems. And what could be more complex than a nation's entire economy? The opportunity seemed a godsend to Beer who immediately flew the 14 hours from England to Santiago with several manuscript copies of his new book in hand. Brain of the firm would turn into the Bible of the Chilean economic management program, and Beer himself would return back to Britain sometimes later, looking more like Castro all the time, with the brand new title of Chile's official scientific director. The plan that Beer and his Chilean colleagues devised was terrifically ambitious. It was composed of four components which were to be assembled at a breakneck pace with the full financial and logistical support of the government. Collectively, the system was termed CyberSign, or perhaps more accurately should be pronounced CyberSyn, as it stood for Cybernetic Synthesis. In this case, the Chileans themselves generally called it Cinco. The first component of CyberSign was the CyberNet, an electronic network that would tie most of Chile's state-run factories to the administration in Santiago. Although Beer wanted to construct this as a digital computer network, perhaps on the model of the United States' new ARPANET, the resources simply were not available to do that. So the engineers hacked together an ad hoc system based on a set of abandoned telex machines with human intermediaries then taking the data that was wired to Santiago and feeding it all into the second component, Cyberstride, a program put together by a team of Beers engineers in Britain. The software would perform a complex electronic simulation of the entire Chilean economy, or rather a few abstracted elements of it, and would run on the two quasi-modern mainframes that the government had access to, such as this type of IBM Model 360. Ideally, this revolution in economic management would be mirrored by one in actual governance. Here, Beer envisioned a program he called Cyberfolk, which would link the populace to national leaders through a technical system akin to the focus group dial sessions some pollsters use today. Perhaps most crucially, this entire system would be managed from a control room or operations room, both on the factory level, where these rooms would ideally be installed for workers' committees to use, and, as in this impressive prototype, on the highest governmental level. Indeed, when he saw this mock-up, President Allende ordered that it be installed directly within La Moneda, 
the presidential palace. We'd like to focus on that demonstration operations room model, not because it was the most important functional component of CyberSign, but precisely because it was not. This room was the visible manifestation of the entire CyberSign system, and that, we'd like to argue, both enabled and eventually doomed the entire grand experiment. With the Ops Room, Beer sought to embed Chile's leaders in a futuristic fantasy of control made real. He achieved this by commingling signs of actual first world technological culture with theatrical effects derived from science fictional entertainment. The design here was borrowed directly from the future, which is to say it was classically modern. This is supposed to be an energizing place, a place of power and action. The wood paneling and indirect lighting evokes the quiet and assured aesthetics of access and privilege of the British private club, while the displays and color scheme connote urgency and potency. The ops room was an immersive diorama of information, arranged to surround the operator with visual cues. This vivid simulation borrows techniques from the 18th century panorama and diorama to present a sense of comprehensive perspective. Situated in an inverted panopticon, subjects sitting at the center of these screens would be presented with a 360 degree view out into the Chilean economy, providing them with the illusion of occupying an omniscopic perspective from which the marketplaces and factories beyond La Moneda's walls were rendered not only visible but legible. And this commanding viewpoint emphasized visual rhetorics of control, where knowledge and power were subtly merged, and the distinction between command of facts and command of resources, including human resources, was effectively elided. When seated there, Chile's leaders found themselves surrounded by glowing screens containing graphically abstracted summaries of diverse economic metrics. The displays convey an impression of having infinite data at one's fingertips. To achieve legibility out of the mass of economic data collected by CyberNet, cyber science designers drew heavily on the modern design tradition that began with the German Bauhaus and stretched through the iconic New York subway maps of Massimo Vinelli, with which they are precisely contemporaneous. This style, shown here in one of the Ops Room display slides, emphasized simplicity and reduction, bold primary colors, clean geometric shapes, sans serif typefaces, and grid-based layouts. Its purpose was to free the reader from unnecessary details, to clarify and abstract, translating the real world into a functional, operational schematic that empowered him to take action. The Ops Room flowcharts and many of Beer's accompanying design diagrams extend this functional rhetoric by appropriating actual scientific and engineering symbols, such as this zigzag squiggle, the electronic symbol for resistor, and this triangle, similar to the electronic symbol for an operational amplifier. Further, Beer attempts a complex metaphorical mapping between his own cybernetic ideas and the technical meanings of these symbols, using the symbol for resistor to stand for his concept of a variety attenuator and the symbol for an op amp for a variety amplifier. Note here that Beer uses the word variety to refer to human autonomy and agency, which is being technically regulated. Occurring within a project that also incorporated copious technical specifications, including actual circuit diagrams, such as this one here, this visual style served to extend the aura of authority that emanated from the futuristic technological aspects of the project to cover its ideological aspects as well. Even the furniture of the room worked to further the fantasy. Beer modeled the design of the ops room chairs on Finnish designer Eero Saarinen's legendary tulip chair. Like other modernist furniture designers, Saarinen took advantage of newfangled materials such as fiberglass to create continuous organic curves and impenetrable shiny surface textures. If the tulip chair looks familiar to you, it's probably because it's the very chair used in another more famous fantastical control room, the Bridge of the Starship Enterprise. Since Star Trek aired in Britain two years previous, 
these chairs had already acquired a patina of science fictional futurity. More specifically, these are the chairs that any self-respecting crew of technological utopians would want to sit in while they navigate the dangers of Romulans or Christian Democrats. Beer modified the tulip chair to include wide rectangular armrests with streamlined integrated controls, just like the Enterprise's captain's chair. In the ops room, each member of the Chilean governmental elite would live out their own fantasy of being Captain Kirk. All these visual touches and physical designs create an impression of modernity and futurism, an illusion of assured, sophisticated, almost casual control. And what could Chile's leaders desire more? As a third world country, cloistered behind an Andean wall from ostentatiously sophisticated and modern neighbors, Argentina and Brazil, this visual rhetoric of ultra-modernism must have been tantalizing. And for a government struggling with the chaos of economic and social turmoil, the promise of panoramic knowledge and direct control must have also seemed utterly irresistible. But let's look a bit more closely at the actual technical functions of that ops room. Beer made clear in his descriptions to his clients that this was to be a control room where the rubber of CyberSign hits the road. This operations room has to be driven and the people in it are the drivers. Yet there is no button or control surface here that actually directly controls anything. Nowhere in the room is there any provision for outputs from the ops room, only informational inputs. Even those chair controls, so reminiscent to us today of a video game pad, are really just the remote for the various information displays. None of those big buttons actually sends a signal outside the ops room complex. They only call up images on the screens as shown here. Now, of course, presumably one could leave the inner sanctum and find a telephone somewhere and give orders verbally. Even in the traditional office, there's one of those on the desk. But there's no desk here. No papers to be signed. Only lounge chairs with ashtrays, cup holders, and those oversized buttons for calling up information onto the projection screens. This is a room functionally designed for omniscience, not omnipotence. For all of its sci-fi trappings, it's a library console, not a launcher of photon torpedoes. The ops room is really a stage set, a model of modernity, not an actual control center at all. Everything about it is an illusion, a Potemkin village. Cybersign is the Emerald City, and the Ops Room is the curtain that conceals the Wizard of Oz. But why was this illusory physical embodiment of power so important? The answer to this question lies deep within Stafford Beer's cybernetic theory. In Brain of the Firm, Beer explains his theory of how every organization comprises a hierarchy of five managerial functions. He illustrates this hierarchy in diagrams such as this one, which indicates the functions of each level in schematic terms. Once more, much of the authority here lies in the very visual rhetoric of illustration. As with the ops room's displays, Beer appropriates scientific and technical symbols to imbue his representations with an aura of intrinsic authority. But as the title of his book makes clear, let alone these images from it, Beer also appropriated organic metaphorics to legitimize his theories. Beer claimed to have derived his five-level hierarchy from the organization of the human central nervous system. It was this organic metaphor which had originally, according to Beer, attracted Dr. Allende, who had been a pathologist before entering politics. And this is one of the primary reasons the ops room was so important for Allende's government, despite the lack of actual executive function. It was the physical manifestation of largely cerebral, diffuse processes and abstract concepts. It vividly promised, but was never actually designed to deliver, a discrete, localized site of operational control in an economic and technical system which was specifically designed to minimize such satisfying top-down hierarchies. This stage set of embodied omnipotence is ancient political theory, as illustrated here, famously, in Thomas Hobbes' 
1651 classic Leviathan. The Ops Room provided a simple location for visualizing an illusion of encapsulated governance. And that illusion was crucial to the bureaucratic and political success which enabled CyberSign's very existence. But there is also a mirage of autonomy and human potency operating at a deeper level throughout the entire cybernetic theory expounded by Stafford Beer. Indeed, more is going on in these organic metaphors than just a mapping of the corporation onto an abstraction of the human brainstem. Technical systems here intrinsically incorporate human components, like the faceless teams who collate and manually enter that cybernet telex data into the cyberstride computers so those ops room displays could be animated so impressively. Indeed, those very displays are not even computer screens. They're only supposed to look that way. In fact, they're slide projections orchestrated by an invisible army of human helpers who, behind the scenes of the ops room, laboriously produce the slides and slot them into old-fashioned Kodak carousels. The technical artifice, in other words, is partly, even largely, composed of living, breathing servo mechanisms to actuate its futuristic displays of cybernetic, organic modernity and to actualize the powerful illusions of omnipotence visualized there. And again, on a deep level, this hybridity of human and machine is intrinsic to cybernetics itself. The science of managing complex institutions and human organizations as if they were, in fact, black box instrumental apparatuses. In essence, then, despite his adamant insistence that he was constructing tools to augment, not interpolate, human capacities, Beer's cybernetics is a vision of the cyborg, the cybernetic organism, which represents the merger of human and technical elements. And in this particular cyborg vision, chillingly, the hierarchies of control are reversed. The humans labor to augment the capacities of the machines. Natural intelligence is subsumed or simply obscured by mechanical screens. This is a dark version of the Wizard of Oz indeed. Yet without the actual possibility of control, what does it matter that the ops room was constructed upon these metaphorics of ominous cyborg embodiment? In early 1973, news of CyberSign, which had up until this point been kept as a great secret, leaked to the international and domestic press. As both were generally quite hostile to Allende's project already, news of the scheme to incorporate the nation into a massive cybernetic control system did not go over very well at all. Indeed, in a sense, CyberSign fell victim to the very mythologies of power and omniscience that it had itself deliberately inculcated through its futuristic design. That illusion of possessive embodied power had proved instrumental in getting the Allende administration to commit to the risky and fabulously expensive program. And it had worked. What national leader would not be attracted to such a perfect physical representation of managerial omnipotence? But now, the rhetorics of cybernetic control looked like a serious liability. Beer's response, in this handwritten speech he prepared for Allende to give in defense of the CyberSign project in January of 1973, was to insist on the benign nature of the operations room. It is not science fiction, he insisted. It is not the machine that uses us. Yet despite these affirmations, fear of technocracy dominated responses to the program's unveiling. As Beer himself later recounted to the historian Eden Medina shortly before he died, the sort of headlines I was getting was, Beer directs Chile from a computer. That's absolutely rubbish. That's not what I was doing. Yet, as the Chilean right-wing magazine Que Pasa declaimed in September of 1973, less than a week before the coup, Cyberstride's biggest problem, however, is that it puts a terrible weapon of control in the hands of the popular unity that could influence the private life of Chilean citizens by cybernetic means. Here, 
was the awful paradoxical product of cyber science illusions of omnipotence. Beer could not very well insist in his defense that the Chilean government had wasted massive amounts of precious resources on a system that was, in a word, impotent. Indeed, even at this stage, the actual state of the ambitious system was not exactly impressive. CyberNet was an assemblage of old telex machines. CyberStride was really only an extremely simplified economic modeling suite. CyberFolk never attracted much enthusiasm beyond beer himself. And the vaunted ops room was in actuality just a mock-up. It wasn't even plugged in. It couldn't even display real economic statistical data, let alone micromanage the nation's economy. This all heightens the irony that by the spring of 1973, Beer was forced into hiding to avoid rumors that this foreigner was secretly delivering the technology of totalitarian control to the Chilean government. Beer was reduced to holing up in an isolated beachfront cottage an hour away from Santiago, where government ministers occasionally discreetly drove out to consult with him. As a result, though, he was far more fortunate than many of his Chilean colleagues when the coup came on September 11th, 1973. Unlike President Allende, Stafford Beer was able to flee the country safely while CIA-backed military officers stormed the seat of government at La Moneda. In one of its first acts under martial law, the ruling junta destroyed the prototype ops room and disconnected the cybernet. Was it that the generals were making a populist gesture to dismantle the supposed technologies of control? Or rather, was it that having eagerly examined the supposed technology of governmental totalitarian omnipotence, they discovered that CyberSign was, at essence, merely a system for coordinating economic statistics and therefore destroyed it as worthless? Disappointed to discover the truth behind the powerful illusions, they may have simply felt the entire system should be disappeared. So many others would share CyberSign's fate in the dark years to come.